Spring is approaching. Summer is approaching. So in January, the board of the Colburn Condo Council thought mid to late March is a great time to have a meeting on landscaping processes for the spring and summer months. We need to remind our boards, we need to have them follow a guide to landscaping processes. So we have two great speakers tonight. We have Brian Scally, who is a member of the board of directors of our advisory council of managing agents. Brian is also, I thought I was going to be able to read this without my glasses. Uh-uh. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot without my glasses. Brian, as I said, is a member of the board of directors of our advisory council of managing agents. He is also a vice president and director of management at Garth Chester Realty. We also have Don Frawley. He is an ACMA member and he is an account executive and property manager, manager at Stillman Management. At this time, we'll start with Brian Scally. Brian and Don work together on this program and I think you'll find it very, very much beneficial. Please welcome Brian Scout. Thank you, Jeff. Diana, thanks for having me. Albert, thank you very much. So with the nicer weather coming, uh, we tend to want to clean up our properties. Hey, Don, how are you? Um, good to see you. No, no problem. Um, start planting spring flowers. We need to keep in mind that March can go out like a lion, much like we're kind of experiencing right now. I want to see that lamb. It's not happening, unfortunately. Um, we've seen too many times where we want to plant spring flowers. We start to get some nice warm weather. We start to clean up the property. We want to plant. Rule of thumb is Mother's Day. Let's wait until around Mother's Day because the weather starts to get a little better. I've seen too often people put the flowers out there. They look great. Get an overnight freeze, plants die. Everyone's yelling, why don't we waste the money? So let's wait, we're just gonna take a step back and wait a little bit before we do it. What we should start with is a thorough cleanup of our property. We wanna start raking the lawns. We wanna clean the planting beds of any leaves that be there or the debris that may have been left in there. Uh, anything that's been blown in or dropped in, get those beds prepared so we can start to picture our plantings and get ready for the plants that are becoming in, coming in. Deep raking of the lawns and de thatching it promotes a better lawn health care. Thick, a thick layer of thatch on the lawn is going to block sunlight. It's going to prevent water from reaching down to the roots and getting the, the roots of the grass to go deeper. If the roots stay up in the top of the grass, it doesn't promote good health care, health uh, of the lawn, or promote better uh, life for the lawn. We also want to go back to those planting beds at this point and remove any dead stalks that we may not have taken out in the fall. Get everything ready, preparation. Pre-emergent fertilization of our lawns. That'll stop the weed growth. A lot of people want to start to aerate our lawns and get air into the soil, but in the spring, weeds are starting to grow. We should aerate in the fall, really not in the spring, because if we aerate now, the weeds are gonna pop up. Not a good thing. We don't want to help weeds, we want to hinder weeds. So the pre-emergent is gonna hold the weeds down. In, in, uh, Place the pre-emergent down, let the, let the rain and everything else bury that into the grass, hold the weeds out. Uh, if there's any bare spots in the lawn, now's the time to start finding them, addressing them. Ice, snow, ice melt has affected the edges of the lawn. Clean those out, rake them out, topsoil, seed, get that ready for moving forward. Uh, pruning dead limbs and trees. A lot of the properties are large, so it's expensive. I've spoken to a number of board members and if we do the whole property, it's, it's just too much money. So do it over three years, do it over five years. Take a piece of uh, the property, prune the trees. As we can see, we're dealing with all these limbs down and these trees down. So if we can crown the top of the trees, we can thin the trees out. It will give us, the snow's not so heavy, the wind can blow through them, just a better, stronger tree for the future. We also want to look at our irrigation system coming into the season. We don't want to start to plant flowers and then find out our irrigation system is broken, the sprinkler heads are broken, they're not working, the timer is not working effectively. We like to water the grass every 24 hours or so for 15 or 20 minute increments. 
early in the morning. A lot of buildings don't want to spend money on irrigation, but we find with sprinklers, they could be running all day, they're not hitting the important areas that they should be hitting, not getting to the plant beds, they're just hitting lawns and certain spots, so you'll actually see where the sprinklers turn, and then there's little brown patches on your properties. Not what we want, again, if we can implement areas to put the irrigation in, it'll work. Piecemeal it over three or five years, it, it's a little bit less of a financial burden to do that. As we're doing this, we want to also keep in mind to look up. We're always thinking about how the grass looks and how our flowers look and the planting and the mulching. Mulching will help keep the beds uh, free of weeds as well. But we don't think about our roofs because the leaves are dropping from our trees onto our roofs and into our gutters. We're thinking about how nice the plants are going to look, but our roofs have got leaves decaying up there, clogging our gutters, creating issues for us as well. So going forward, think about that as well. Be proactive with cleaning all these areas out, making sure that we're ready when the warm weather finally does hit, that when the flowers go in, the grass is now ready to be green, good health care, productive, and the flowers are going to be able to grow well during the season. Thank you. Good job. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Try again. <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> All right, thank you. I know it was a good dinner and uh, dessert. My name is Don Frawley. Um, as was mentioned, I'm an account executive with Stillman Management. Um, I've been with Stillman for about 15 years. I started out there as a property manager. Um, I still have one property over here in White Plains that I still do manage personally, but. Um, I work with seven other different property managers and oversee a portfolio of about 23 properties. So I have pretty much uh, a gamut of um, co-ops, condos, homeowners associations that I work with on a daily basis. Um, and while you know we look at infrastructure as you know one of the main things that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. We have to think that landscaping is a very large part of that infrastructure. Um, it, like each one of us in this room and everything else that we have, ages over time. Things uh, that were planted once and um, were of the right size and of the right place um, because of things around it. Trees grow up around shrubs. Shrubs uh, are allowed to grow too tall, atmospheric conditions, weather, things that ease nature, uh, change things from year to year, decade to decade. And where I'm going with this is that, you know, we need to have a master plan when we look at our landscaping. And uh, as was mentioned, rather than trying to do something, you know, we all have you know, we really want our property to pop. We want the entrance to pop. We want, when people drive in, our friends to come and visit those who are living in that community to say, wow, this is a beautiful place. And landscaping provides that. Um, so we want to have a, a master plan, and we want to try and implement that over a number of years. Things didn't get to look the way that they look right now overnight and they're certainly not going to get to where you probably want them to be overnight. And a one, three, or five year plan, just like you do with a capital study, is the way that you want to uh, address or approach these types of things. Um, one of the things that I always encourage is a committee. There are many people in your community, in our communities, that are active, uh, you know, landscaping type, they have the green thumb. I'm not one of them, but they do have a green thumb. And, you know, we need to tap those resources and we need to call on those people to help us come up with some ideas on how to do that. Um, your professional, your landscaper is, uh, or landscape architect, um, is someone that you want to consider um, talking to about the condition of your property and again how you want to go ahead and change those things over time. Um, if you're in a position where you either don't have a landscape or some of the smaller communities um, don't have landscaping, the, the staff, a porter is often used to cut the grass or to trim the, uh, the shrubs around the property but um, 
you know, and oftentimes a community to save money will bring in a, uh, a company, a landscaping company to do a, you know, a spring cleanup, as was mentioned, and then again in the fall to get rid of the leaves and things of that nature. Um, but, uh, you know, for a relatively small amount of money, if you don't have a lot of grass, um, I'm sure you have planting beds around, uh, you know, the community. And those are things that can be easily addressed um, where you could put in annuals and again, to really spruce up that curb appeal. Um, to be honest, this is something that, although it's never too late, this is something that really should be going on in the fall. Um, is trying to address these things that we want to do in the spring. Um, it's going to be spring very soon, I hope. Um, but, uh, you know, we do have to have a plan in order to go forward to be, you know, successful. And, that, and that's what we want. Um, as I mentioned, our, our infrastructures are aging. And, um, you know, atmospheric conditions are, are constantly changing. You know, we have these nor'easters. We just went through what I consider the perfect storm. A lot of pine trees are in the Westchester area. A lot of the properties that we manage have pine trees. Well, you have a lot of rain, so you have extremely wet ground. You have a shallow root system, and then you throw in 60, 70, 80 mile an hour winds and the amount of trees that I've seen gone down are just, oh, pushed over. I'm not talking about snapping, I mean just totally uprooting 60, 70, 80 year old pines that have been on our properties forever are just being blown over and, you know, it almost looks like you could get a little crane and, and kind of push it back up. Um, but unfortunately, once that root system is, up, uh, is taken up, it, it's, it's gone. Um, we also have to look at, you know, the other environmental conditions, you know, do we have water, as was mentioned in the sprinkler system. If you don't and you're trying to grow grass, you're going to be very unsuccessful. So it's something that you want to consider in your community. Um, the salt that we use to clean our parking lots, the calcium chloride that we put down on our walkways, um, these are all harmful to the plants and the grasses that are around our property. And when we do that spring cleanup, we need to be cognizant of that and have a professional that knows how to, you know, take care of it so that we can address it in the beginning of the spring and allow things to germinate when we do want to go ahead and plant grass. Um, sun and shade, again, as I mentioned, when we start out building a community, we have a tree this big and we have a shrub this big. Well, that tree ultimately is now 30, 40, 50 feet tall, and the shrub that was there no longer gets what it requires, and it may need to be changed, it may need to be moved. Um, and again, seeking the uh, advice of a professional landscape architect, uh, many of the landscape companies that, that I deal with have architects, <coughs> Um, on staff, so it's not like you're going to have to pay to have a separate professional come in and do that. Um, I do encourage you, if you are or have recently done a capital study, to make sure that when you interview with that engineer or architect, that you bring that up as part of what you want involved in that capital study. Um, there are just, you know, so many different variables. Um, we often talk about, we go to our annual meetings and we talk to our communities and we say that, you know, we want to do X, Y, and Z to improve our property value. We're always trying to increase the value of our property. And not, not the most inexpensive, but probably one of the easiest things to do is the landscaping around our communities. So I would be more than happy to entertain any questions, as uh, I'm sure he would, um, for anyone here. And um, I thank you so much for listening. Questions?
ask anyone? No questions. Go ahead, yes, ma'am. One of our perennial, if you'll excuse the pun, problems with our landscaping is that we have been unable to find a grounds maintenance company that understands that you don't take hedge trimmers to your ornamental shrubs and, and small flowering trees. And as many companies as we have been through and as many conversations as we have had with them, we have been unable to convey this message so that it, it, it finds, it filters its way down to the crew on the ground who come in. And even more uh, perplexing uh, is that none of them seem to offer hand pruning as a service, which could, I think, be very profitable for them. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in, you know, do you, you must see this, do, do you have any a solution? Do you have a recommendation? It, it is an excellent question, first of all. Um, you know, and I often look at it from the other side with regard to trees. And I say this, if a tree is lying dead on the ground, I don't need an arborist to remove it. However, if it's standing up straight, I'm not going to use a landscaper to trim it. Um, there are certain specialties for each uh, type of you know, system that we have in our community. Um, it is something that I hear often. Um, someone will have planted something in front of a home, normally in a, possibly a homeowners association, and here comes the landscaper's guy on a Tuesday and he just shredded this thing that she's cultivated and grown for the past 10 years. Um, I don't know if I have a specific answer other than to say, I think if you're looking for a new landscaping company, that it's certainly one of the things that I would uh, encourage you to ask. And how, more importantly, just, you know, that oversight is there someone on site or, you know, oftentimes I see landscapers come in and cut the grass like the place is on fire. They're trying to get in and get out and get to the next place so they can get home, I guess. I mean, we all want to get home, but we also have a job to do. So I would encourage you to find out what type of oversight or supervision is there when the men or women are on site. Um, I work with a a woman who owns a landscaping company. Her name is Maria Lorenzo, and, and she's, she's one of the best. She is excellent, and she has a crew of guys that have been with her probably 15 or 20 years. Um, she takes care of my property that I was speaking of earlier, Cobblefield, which is off Rosedale Avenue in White Plains. It's about 55 acres. 97 homes in there, all million dollar homes, and, and uh, it's quite challenging, all kinds of trees and different kinds of uh, ecosystems, micro ecosystems in there, and, and she's amazing. And when we interviewed her and others to replace the then current landscaper, um, that was one of the things that we were most interested in. Um, anyone can cut grass, let's face it. Um, it's, it's the other parts that go along with it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, like, like Don said, Maria is one of the best and there's a reason she is. And, and, and I like to kind of interject. Owner-operated landscaping companies, I think, are, are one of the best because the owner's on the site. The owner's going to come by. He may not be physically cutting your grass sometimes, but he's going to be. I have a lot of companies that are, you'll see the owner with a backpack blower or a lawnmower or whatever he's doing, but he's working. And he's on site and he's checking on his guys. That's the guy I want cutting my grass. Absolutely right. I want a specialist that's cutting my bushes, not just, you don't want me cutting the bushes, trust me, because one leg shorter than the other, and that's what you're going to get. You want somebody that's qualified. When you're interviewing landscapers, we all meet them in a room and they, everybody sells their wares and they sound terrific. Go to the properties, drive by, see what they're doing. Drive by, you know, you know East Chest, drive by Garth Road and look at the front of the buildings. Get a, get a picture of what the landscapers are doing and talk to the people. If you can talk to the supers of the buildings, they're going to let you know if they're happy with them or if they're not. Do the guys come and in 20 minutes they're gone or do they spend time? Quality time, because that's what you're looking for. You're looking for people that are going to spend time and take pride and ownership of what they're doing. 
Excuse me. You mentioned the sprinkles. Some, some co-ops may think it's, a, it's a, a, a big expense. But we found over the long run we saved money. And maybe you might want to go into that for people who are hesitant about sprinkles because the waste of man out of fighting with sprinkles uh, with the hands and people tripping over hoses and then forgetting to need to turn the water off. I mean, you waste water, you waste man hours. Sure. And maybe, I mean, I'm only talking about my property. You guys have much more. So, the irrigation systems, which I mentioned earlier this evening, and Caesar's mentioning, the pros and cons. Um, as I mentioned, if you have hoses all over the grass that leave marks on the lawn and they burn those areas, they don't, they're not as effective. They're also, you're also going to pay more money in water bills because they're running for much longer periods of time. When you install an irrigation system, you're probably running that system for maybe 15 minutes depending upon the weather. It could be 20, 30 minutes in August, but it's a much shorter period of time. It's hit the area, shuts off, and hits another area. A lot of times we don't have enough water pressure to run 30 sprinkler heads on a hose. It's impossible. So we have buildings that'll try to do it and they're getting 10 feet of area as opposed to covering the lawn and the plants and the, and the planting beds. So irrigation is, while it's upfront cost, if you do it in sections, it's cost effective to do it. It gets better coverage. Workforce, it's automatic. It comes on at four in the morning, and shuts off at four thirty in the afternoon. The super, the porter doesn't have to turn the handle on and then forget to shut it off later in the night. Somebody crossing the hose across the sidewalk, somebody trips on the hose, now you have a tripping hazard and a trip and fall suit, and they got to notify your insurance company. So the only issues with the, uh, the irrigation is sometimes a head breaks or a piece breaks underneath, and they're easily fixed. Most of the staff can fix them by that point, or the landscaper has a, a gentleman that can fix it. So I'm 100% in, always recommending the irrigation system over sprinklers. Do your landscapers stay for years and years, or do you have turnover like every three, five years? Yeah. Most of the time my landscapers stay because I've gotten to a point where I've done this a long time. So I, I'm very comfortable with most of my landscapers. If I'm changing, there's a reason I'm changing. They're not doing what I want them to do. They're not pruning the way they should be. Sometimes landscapers will grow and take on too many accounts. So I want people that stay in a restricted area. Snowplow, we see, you know, a guy will take a job in Harris and then he'll be in Mount Vernon. He's not going to plow your property effectively unless he's got trucks in those areas. Right. Same thing with a landscaper. If he has one crew and they're trying to service 40 properties, never going to happen. And you'll see that very quickly. If you're comfortable, report. Have a conversation with your landscaper. Open communication. If you're not happy, speak to them. See, you know, I've noticed the last couple of weeks You've cut the grass, but the guys aren't edging as well, and the hedges, you've kind of left them. You know, we, grass should be cut maybe once a week, two and a half, three inches high, in the summer, August, a little higher. If they're not doing that, have a conversation. Give them the opportunity to explain why. They may have a reason why, but have an open communication. And then, if you're not satisfied, that's when you're going to want to start to look. But generally, if you're happy, Marie, it's going to be a long-term relationship. Do you have any perennials you love for our zone? <laughs> I would defer that, honestly. I have black thumbs. I can build a house, I can't plant a thing. Um, just one of, my, one of my things. I defer to uh, uh, landscapers. The problem is that we have animals in this area that eat every single thing that looks beautiful. So, you know, if I put pretty flowers outside my house, two days later they're gone because the deer eat every one of them. So you can Google, Google is a great thing. You can find out what's deer resistant or plant, but they're not colorful. That's part of the problem. So, uh, you know, I defer to the experts on, on that. I bring in a landscape, I mentioned her. Landscape designers are wonderful. They have a plan. I like to have a plan too. This is what I'd like to see. Have recommendations. Go online and look. Absolutely, nothing. committee, if you want to join, I don't mean, I talk a lot, I'm sorry. But have a plan with what you want, because designers have plans what they like, and this is what I've done, and you'll tend to see buildings somewhat start to mesh and mold into one big area. Have a plan how you want to, what you want to see. I'd like to see some yellow and red and blue, and maybe you don't like yellow, so you only want pinks and reds. But give them an idea to work with, and then we can come back and, and have a design together. Again, the communication, I think, is the most important thing. But asking a professional on that is the best thing. And, and David, you know, um, 
I, I know this gentleman, David. Uh, David is a board member uh, at Hudson View over on Warburton Avenue in Yonkers, right near the uh, planetarium just up the street. And again, your particular locale is going to face its own circumstances with environmentals. You're right on the water. Uh, there's not a lot of coverage. The wind is blowing from west to east and it's coming straight across your property. So, um, again, I recently um, was managing a property um, in Rye, uh, right next to Playland. And um, when they had uh, Superstorm Stan Sandy or Hurricane Sandy, some people, the damage that occurred uh, there, you know, was devastating to the homes that were along the water. But you had to see the amount of damage and the insurance claim against the landscaping. It was in hundreds of thousands of dollars. And again, okay, so now we have to rebuild this community. Somebody built it 25 years ago when Water's Edge was designed. Um, and that was their plan and their thought. But we have our own community now. We are owners. We're not the sponsor anymore. So what do we want to do? And a lot of time and research and education had to go into designing that property over again. Because again, even on a casual winter afternoon when there's salt spray coming up, you know, what plants work, what plants survive, what plants won't. You know, um, everybody wants a salt water fish tank until they realize how much maintenance is required in a saltwater fish tank. Um, they're beautiful, but they, they, there's hours and hours and months that have to be spent in maintaining that small ecosystem. A saltwater fish tank, or a freshwater rather, is, you know, there's a little bit of maintenance, but you basically throw the fish in, you throw a little food, and you have a great day. Um, same thing goes with this, you know, uh, so it's, I really wouldn't say that, like, um, you know, for instance, uh, hydrangea or a, uh, you know, one, one particular perennial over another, um, you know, what, what, what's in keeping with not only the area with you're in, you, you have brick buildings, you know, somebody who has a different facade, maybe a, a wooden facade or something else, that it's not going to look the same or maybe not as appealing. Um, you know, are we doing signs around the front of the building? Are we doing the entrances by the buildings? Um, you know, are we doing focal points, pots, uh, you know, in, in certain locations? So all of those things, again, as much input as you can get from the community, from the folks that are going to enjoy and appreciate that, and again, how many times are we going to an, uh, an annual meeting and the community goes, we never get to say anything. You guys do everything. We never get any input. Everything's a secret. It's not transparent. This is the way to get owners involved. Get the shareholders to work together, be on your side, and help bring the community together, increase in property value, and making it aesthetically beautiful. Other questions? Albert. Uh, just, a, just a comment. Uh, when I was at the County Planning Department, we had a very active landscaping uh, architecture uh, division. And one of our greatest resources is Cornell Cooperative Extension. And they might have uh, recommendations for uh, you know, landscape contractors, uh, also the types of plants, depending on what you want. And at least, if my memory serves me correctly, the trend has been weather-wise, very hot, dry summers, yes. and very, needless to say, very wet and snowy winters. And there's a whole field of, um, I, I forget the term, zero something gardening, zero which, which, which uh, deals with plants that don't need a lot of water mm -hmm. during the summertime. Mm -hmm. Some of them are quite beautiful, you know, grasses and, and, and the like. Uh, but Cornell Cooperative Extension you know, is, is a um, it, it, was, it is really interesting. I had forgotten a number of years ago, um, it, it, uh, a community that I was involved in, they were having, it, it was a, uh, a property that had beautiful grass, um, 
and it started to turn. And was it, did we have too much rain? Did we have not enough rain? Uh, we were kind of scratching our heads going back and forth on what really needed to be done to kind of turn this thing around because it, it got really, really ugly. It was a beautiful community, um, not that they all are. And we brought in uh, someone from Cornell and they took soil samples and they came back and they said, you have this much phosphate, this much nitrite, nitrate, you know, zinc, all of these different things in there. And they gave us, this is free of charge, by the way, they gave us a blueprint to follow that we then hired a, um, a grass specialist. It wasn't the landscaper. The landscaper came in, they did their five applications. We brought in a separate company to address just these issues with the grass. And it took about two years, but it came back and even better than it was before. So thank you, that's, that's an excellent resource. And again, this was something that, you know, yeah. didn't cost anything. Um, there's their students, they're, uh, they're gaining information from things like this, they wanna work out in the field, and they're willing to do this at your property if you're experiencing a problem of, of this nature. Um, one other thing too with landscaping, um, I have a, a properties with ponds on them. I don't know if any of you uh, have a situation like that with aerators and duckweed is a big problem uh, and those types of things. That's the big green um, uh, algae that you see growing on top. And I've recently, in the last couple of years, been able to be somewhat successful in controlling that by using carp. Bless you. Uh, and uh, you buy carp 10, 12 inches and they eat it. And that's their diet. And it really does cut down on it. Um, oftentimes we're not a golf course where a golf course can go and throw chemicals in something and it just kills everything. A lot of times ours comes from rain or storm water and it goes into a you know municipality eventually. So um, that was uh, something that was uh, pretty unique. But don't stop asking those types of questions or seeking that type of advice. You have your property manager, your landscaper, uh, your community, there are a lot of people, you know, when we set up a board, we see people that have, you know, a legal background, a financial background, um, you know, a construction background. Well, equally as important as someone who has a lot of knowledge about landscaping. Yes, sir. Okay. To go to Cornell Cooperative, I, I, I've been involved for the better part of 22 years. I'm running a 37 acre campus. Okay. Facilities. I do a lot of landscaping stuff, etc., mm -hmm. etc. I've worked with Cornell. I've had my pesticide license. I've done all those things. If you're looking for a landscaper, walk around with the owner mm -hmm. or whoever's coming out to do that mm -hmm. to estimate or to give you a price on the job. Walk around, feel them out, see what they really know, find out what's going on. Ask them if they belong to the New York State Turf and Landscape Association. Because if they do, they're serious. Right. Because they also, the New York State Turf and Landscape Association also offers opportunities to train their workers. Because as you said, somebody can go out and just cut grass. Right. But when you run into questions like pruning, New York State, State Turf and Landscape Association have annual seminars. Cornell Cooperative Extension has, uh, I think they have bi-monthly classes. Uh, and some of those topics are things like how to prune a shrub. Right. And they will invite their employees to come to them. So get people that have these professional associations. Mm -hmm. There are young guys out there, young guys and gals that want to start their own business, and, but they don't know the greater industry. You mentioned earlier, don't have a landscape of that your tree. That is a huge mistake. Right. An arborist is trained for a reason. Right. There's so much to know right. in that. You can create enormous, enormous damage. When you have a, a sidewalk going in, Guy comes in with the machine, the bobcat, he rips up the old sidewalk. Guess what? He just opened the door for pathogens to go into that tree. Five years from now, you're going to have a tree on top of your building. Have an arborist come in. Have an arborist come in and root for him. So absolutely, stick to the professional organizations. The New York State Turf and Landscape Association, absolutely ask Cornell. If you, Cornell will do a soil test. Perfect example. If, you, if your pH is off, Right. You can put all the fertilizer you want. All it's doing is washing out through the soil right. and ending up in the water table.
because it cannot be taken up by the soil because the pH is wrong. Mm -hmm. These are things, little tiny things that the general person doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. But absolutely lean on a Cornell, a New York State for Lawrence, uh, Landscape, uh, Turf and Landscape Association member. Um, and the big guys have those, those, those relationships. Walk around your owner. Make a, 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 put it in your contract that you want the owner on site once a month to meet with your super. Have them walk around with your super to look at the issues that you've addressed with your super. Right. Those are just a couple of things. And, I go and again, the landscapers don't just work five days a week either. So because of, um, uh, you can have the landscaper come on a Saturday and meet with you and to discuss, as we were saying earlier, you know, we, we have some issues here we want to address or we want to look at things. Or I want to pick your brain about a couple of things I see over here that are happening or what can we do over there. Um, really, the sky's the limit with landscaping, um, you know, but again, slow and steady wins the race. Um, we don't want to change everything at once, gradually, um, which, you know, creates that curb appeal that we want, and it doesn't overwhelm us with regard to cost. You know, we're all looking, you know, when that dollar amount starts coming out, it's like, you know, an arborist? I don't know. You know, but again, the right person for the right job, the right tool for the right job. And also, when you figure it out on a per unit basis, mm -hmm. so if it's a thousand dollars to get the arborist out, mm -hmm. but if you look at it and you say, well, I have 500 units, you do the math, it's not that much money anymore. Right. And if right. you're making an improvement to the building, yeah. making it safer, right. uh, the health of the tree, all of those things, yeah. then the justification is a little easier, a little easier to swallow. Yeah. Absolutely. Please join me in thanking Brian Scowlin.